I want to um, ask you to help me name this city. See if you can figure out what city this is. It's a bustling metropolis. It's a hub of world commerce. And the population is made up of people from all over the world. There's a major disparity between rich and poor. There are many foreign religions represented in this city. It's known for its prosperity, but at the same time, it's known for its sexual promiscuity. And though there is a great Christian influence in this city, it's mainly known as a secularized society. Just shout it out. What city do you think that is? Okay, I heard New York City. I heard San Francisco. Kansas City. All right. Where now? Hollywood. Las Vegas. Corinth. <laughs> it's Corinth. <laughs> but isn't it amazing? Now that's why I've chosen to work through this book. We're doing a series on issues that we're facing today, but the Lord's led me to do this in a verse-by-verse -verse study for this very reason. I want you to see when we speak about certain issues that our country is facing today, I want you to see it in the context in which it's found. So many times I think that Sometimes it can be tempting to, to pull an issue out and find a few verses that, that talk about it. I want you to see it in the entire context so you can see, for example, that you can see how that Corinth was so much like we are today. And so if you will, take your Bibles this morning and we will look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But let's talk a moment. Let me give you a little, little bit of introduction about this city of Corinth so we can lay the foundation so you can understand it. Corinth was west of Athens. And it was the capital of a province that's known as Achaia. Isn't that amazing? Achaia. Achaia. That's, it's uh, hard to pronounce. This province included most of Greece. Now, Rome destroyed Corinth originally. And then they came back in and refounded it. And they, they reestablished it as a Roman colony. And at this point, after Rome had refounded the city, it became populated with uh, mainly Roman military veterans. There were also many freed slaves that had been recently freed in the Roman Empire that made their way to Corinth. And then also there were a few Greeks who had stayed behind through the entire turmoil. Now, Corinth received travelers from the east and the west, and it was situated in such a way that it was a major trade route. Uh, that's why they had so much commerce, but it also created this ethnic diversity that existed in Corinth. Now, its commercial success was rivaled only by its decadence. Immorality was so well known in Corinth that the philosopher Aristophanes coined a Greek verb based on this city. He called it Corinthosami, and it means to act like a Corinthian. And he used this term, and eventually in his vocabulary and in the vocabulary of other people, it became synonymous with sexual immorality. Now, the Corinthians drew attention to their lewdness through their worship of Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. And Corinth was so corrupt that Greek plays often depicted Corinthians as drunkards and reprobates. The city was also filled with idolatrous religions. Now, when you put all that together, no wonder Dr. Chuck Messler, describing Corinth, put it like this. He said, Corinth was the Las Vegas or the Bourbon Street of the old world, a center of debauchery and sexual excess. So if we wanted to describe, if we wanted to discern what a place can become if they continue in this slide that Corinth did, We've picked the right city. Now, here's what's amazing. 
in spite of all the excess, in spite of all the immorality of their citizens. Corinth also was a strategic location for spreading the gospel. Paul founded, the Apostle Paul founded the church at Corinth on his second missionary journey. And when he first came there, he labored along with a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers, and Paul was too, so they worked together. And Paul, in the beginning, went after his Jewish brethren. But after a short while, it was evident that they rejected the message, and so he turned to the Gentiles. And once he turned to the Gentiles, he began to see souls saved, and he established the church And after he established the church and had been there for a while, he left, went right back out on his missionary journeys. And about three years later, Paul received a letter from some of the members of the church at Corinth who were very disturbed because of some horrible things that were happening at that church. And that's what became this book of Corinthians. There were serious difficulties in the assembly. And they also, because they lived in this pagan society and they were trying to figure out how to live out their their Christianity in this pagan place, they had several questions for Paul. Now the church, uh, of course, as we've said, was struggling to live a godly life in a pagan society. So the theme of this letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians became this, how God wants believers to live in the midst of a corrupt culture. By the way, I want to stop and just say, as we've been speaking to issues, I, I had a moment at time to listen to Pastor Mays' message last week, and brother, you did a fantastic job, and everybody said amen. Would you give him amen? Amen. I love the way he talked about truth, and it's important that we understand what truth is. Now, to address the problems that... Uh, Paul was fa- that Corinth was faced with, Paul reminded them of one important thing, and that's the topic of our s- sermon today. Remember who you are. Sometimes when we live in such, a, in such turbulent times, when we live in, in such a society that is more and more turning itself away from God and more toward the world, if we're not careful, especially in this day with so much information, so much media, so many opportunities, not, and not just opportunities, sometimes uh, these things come to us uninvited. When there's so much that's coming to us that is perfectly formed by the advertisers and promoters to be salacious, to be tempting, to lead you toward the pleasures of the world and away from the things of God, we need to remember who we are. And who are we? Now, this may surprise some of you, but we, I think most of you understand that you are saints. You're saints. Have you ever said to somebody, well, I'm no saint? Well, you better be. You are a saint. And you don't need, you don't have to perform some notable miracle or be proclaimed by the Catholic Church as a saint to be a saint. You're a saint. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a saint. Now turn back and say, and you're a saint. And then say, live like one. No, don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) It'd be all right, but look what he says in verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. I want you to underline sanctified and called. With all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Did you catch that? Who are saints? Everyone who's ever called upon the Lord Jesus for salvation. Paul said, everybody who's ever called on Christ for salvation, no matter where they live. That's what he's saying here. No matter where they live, no matter who they are, if they've called on Christ for salvation, they are called to be a saint. And notice that word called there. Did you know it's the same Greek word 
for the word that Paul uses in verse 1 for, that, for his calling into the ministry? Paul said, I'm called to be an apostle. And then notice what he says, and you're called to be a saint. You have a special calling upon your life. You need to realize that. Some of you may be sitting here this morning, and you've never really grasped what God's will is for your life. Well, as we know, God's grace is manifold, which means many-sided, and he has given us many gifts. And you may not have discovered everything that God wants you to be, but one thing I know for sure he wants you to be is a saint. And you know what the word saint means? Holy one. Holy one. You are called to be holy. You're not called to be glamorous. You're not called to be uh, superior intellectually. You're not called to be a performing athlete. You're not called to be a recognized politician. You can do all those things and be a blessing to others, but you are called to be a saint before anything else. You're called to be holy. Paul says, everyone in every place who calls on the name of Jesus for salvation is called to be a saint of God. Now, Paul reminds us that along with the title comes a great responsibility. Now, we ought to be thrilled that God looks at us as saints, but we need to remember that all saints are sanctified. And the word sanctified, simply, it's just another way of saying set apart for God, or as I said a moment ago, holy. Holy means, the word holy and the word sanctified, by the way, if you go and look it up in the Greek, the word sanctified in the Greek means, listen to this, internally purified and reformed. You have been changed from the inside out. You are internally purified and reformed. Not something, listen, not something that you learned externally. Not a list of rules that you went by. No, internally purified and reformed. The moment that you accepted Christ as your Savior on the inside you were purified and reformed. And Paul is saying, let me remind you guys, this is your answer. Before I even begin this letter, Paul's saying, let me tell you, this is the main answer. If you will just obey this, if you'll just realize this, if you'll just follow this, if you'll just be who God called you to be, it'll answer everything. You can live in a pagan society if you'll remember who you are. You don't have to be defiled by the world if you'll remember who you are. They needed to be reminded that they had been sanctified. They had been set apart for God. And just, listen, here's, in case you're having a hard time grasping what this means, let me give you a good illustration. Just like when a man and woman pledge their love for each other, and they're set apart for each other. And think about this. Once a man and wife pledge their love for each other and they're married, they are set apart for each other, and therefore any other relationship outside of marriage is sinful. You've heard me say this. I say it at weddings occasionally. But uh, the woman puts a ring on that man's finger to cut off his circulation, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul saying is, is, says this, that ring that God gave you called sanctification, that term that he gave you called saint is supposed to cut off your circulation in the world. You're not to have any other relationship. He is your relationship. This is amazing. But this thought came to me this morning and I grabbed my computer and ran this off the printer. I want you to see something that's important here, that, that this life that we're called to live is something that is from, once again, is from the inside out. I'm going to read you something in just a moment, but I want you to hear what Mr. McDonald, William McDonald, one of the greatest commentary writers I've ever experienced, 
has this statement here, talking about being sanctified. He says, sanctified means set apart to God from the world and describes the position of all who belong to Christ. Now, he says, you already, did you notice that? You already have that position. Did you catch that? Paul says, God already says, you're holy. Positionally speaking, you're sanctified. But then Mr. McDonald goes on to say, as to their practical condition, they should set themselves apart day by day in holy living. We talked about this a few weeks ago. What's on the inside, your salvation, Paul says, now you're to work it out. Folks, listen, you already have the power. You just need to do something with it. You just need to do something with it. Mr. McDonald goes on to say, in discussing the many problems of the assembly and personal life, speaking of Corinth, the apostle constantly reminds his readers that Jesus Christ is Lord and that all we do should be done in acknowledgement of this great truth. Now, folks, think about that. If you have been truly born again, if you've truly been saved, he not only is the bride or excuse me, the groom, and you're the bride, but he is Lord. He's Lord. He's master. He gets to call the shots of everything that you do. So since that's true, our lifestyle and purpose in life is to be different. You know, one easy way to think about the world, you say, well, how do I decide what I do? Different. You know, God never called us to be better than the world. He did call us to be different. We can't compete with some of the pizzazz that goes on in the world. We can't compete with some of the things that, that, that the world's able to do, but we can be different. We can dare to be different, and that's something they can't be. Our lifestyle and purpose in life is to be different than those who follow after the things of the world. Now, I'm, not, now I'm sure about now some of you are asking the same questions the Corinthians asked. How can I live a holy life in such a wicked environment? How can I live what I believe when I'm tempted and tried on every hand? First, it's very important that you understand what true holiness is. Now, that's where some folks get messed up. So I want to help you today to understand what true holiness is. You need to understand what it is before you try to live it because there are folks that are trying to live what somebody else has told them was holiness and they're very discouraged. There are some folks that are trying to live up to what somebody else has said. This is holiness and it, number one, is not making much sense to them and number two, they're very discouraged. Let's talk about what holiness is really is. Some believe that to live a holy life, you must get away from the world altogether and live in communes like a hermit. In fact, that was such a prevalent teaching in the Catholic Church for so long. That that's why you see all these monasteries up. <laughs> you ever seen where some of these are located? One of my favorite pictures of these things is, is this monastery that's on a cliff. I don't even know what country it's in. And way up high. And, and I'm thinking that's about as far from the world as you can get. I'm surprised that they haven't had some monastery. They're probably planning monasteries on Mars. But you can't get far enough. And by the way, if you do that, if you go live in a monastery, can I give you a little hint? You're still there. You're still there. The flesh is still with you. But here's something more important. If you go and live in that monastery, how is anybody else going to see the light that Christ has put in you? How are they going to see the change in your life and be moved to be changed themselves? Jesus says, you're not only called to be holy, you're called to be lights in the world. And your calling is twofold. It's to live a godly life and it's to live it in the, in the midst, in the presence of lost people so they can see the difference and desire to know Christ themselves. Think about that. So we know that isolation is not the answer. And then there are those who equate holiness with following a bunch of external rules. 
Now, it's true that we need biblical guidelines. You should live by this book every day, the principles in this book. This is where you get the information to know how to live a godly life. But be careful about following legalistic rules. I recall when I was first saved and after I had gone to Bible college, left my hometown, gone to Bible college, I'd heard consistent Bible teaching uh, no confusion whatsoever, but when I got down to Bible college, I began to hear everybody's list of rules, and everybody had a different one. And it seemed like to me that if I obeyed this guy's bunch of rules, then this other guy would come along and say, well, but there's another one. And it becomes frustrating. Folks, let me tell you, that's not holiness. That's not holiness. Holiness, listen carefully. Holiness is more than separating ourselves from certain things. And if you don't get anything else today, get this. Holiness is produced by the love of God in our hearts. It's all about our love relationship with God. By the way, if you're not spending time alone with God in prayer and you're not spending time in the Word... How can you have a relationship? Can you, ima- can you imagine this? A fellow gets married. Uh, he says, I do. They have the, the big uh, reception afterwards, a big party, and everybody's happy, and couples dancing together, and everybody says, oh, how in love they are. And they go on the honeymoon, and, and they're, they're both just enraptured with each other's love. And then the day they get back from the honeymoon, the husband walks in and says, okay, um, I've told you I love you, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, We had a ceremony, right? Yeah. Um, It was great, wasn't it? Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. How'd you like the honeymoon? Oh, it was wonderful. Okay, I just need for you to know something. That's it. From this moment, now think about this. Think of the absurdity. From this moment on, I'm just going to go live my life the way I want to live it. I'll check in with you every now and then. Probably around Christmas and Easter. I said, probably around Christmas and Easter. I'll check in with you. I'll come visit. I'll even give you, I'll give you two hours those days. But from that moment on, but, but, but for the most part, I'm going to live my own life. You would say, that ain't no marriage. Yeah, and there ain't no salvation either. It ain't no holy living either. It ain't no relationship with God either, is it? Can you see how absurd that is? No, listen to me. Holiness, holiness is produced by the love of God in your heart. If you really love God, you're going to want to be in his house. You're going to want to be close to him. You're going to want to hear what he has to say, and you're going to have something to say to him. It's a relationship, and it's driven by love. And that brings me to this. I couldn't believe this. Well, let me read this first. Dr. David Jeremiah I'm sure you've heard of him, said this, the person who loves God with all his heart will soon discover that the sins often included on the legalist list are reduced from his life naturally as he falls more and more in love with the Lord. It was this kind of holiness that turned the world upside down in Paul's day. Wow. Wow. Ladies, let me ask you this. Do you want your husband to love you out of obligation? Well, I married you, so I guess I better show some kind of kindness to you. Huh? Uh, Honey, we don't talk much anymore. Well, I took out the trash. Yeah. I, I, I went to work today. I brought you money, didn't I? How would you like that kind of relationship? Did you know that even sometimes in the world they figured it out? This came to my mind this morning as I was preparing to leave, and I could not resist. I looked this up, and I copied it off. See if you can recognize this. This is, this is the reflection of a man who is doing all that he does for his wife because he loves her. Be, listen, he's doing this because he says, you're mine. Maybe some of you can recognize this fellow. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. 
I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine, I walk the line. I find it very, very easy to be true. I find myself alone when each day is through. Yes, I'll admit that I'm a fool for you. Because you're mine, I walk the line. As sure as night is dark and day is light, I keep you on my mind both day and night. And happiness I've known proves that it's right. Because you're mine, I walk the line. You've got a way to keep me on your side. You give me cause for the love that I can't hide. For you, I know I'd even try to turn the tide. Because you're mine, I walk the line. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine, I walk the line. That great prophet Johnny Cash <laughs> spoke of a real love relationship. But did you catch some of the wording there? Could that not be said of our God? Because you're mine, I want to be holy. Because you're mine, I want to do what's right. Because you're mine, I want to let the world know you're the only one. That's true holiness. Think about that. Paul goes on to say in, in verses 4 through 9, he makes it clear that everything we need is given to us by Jesus Christ, and everything is possible as we grow in our relationship with him. Notice what he says. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace. We told you a couple of weeks ago, grace is not just favor. It's not just an act of forgiveness. It is also power. I, I think of grace this way. It is the want to and the power to do what's right. It's the want to and the power. When God gives you grace at the moment of salvation, he has not only shown favor to you to forgive you of your sins, but he has also equipped you with the power and even the desire to do the right thing. Paul says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God. Notice, notice all of this that we have. The grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in every, uh, everything by him, in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also, catch this, confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Did you catch this? Paul doesn't mention anything externally. It's all internal. It's all internal. And did you notice something here? You may have read this and said, who's Paul talking about? Who's he talking about? These people are, <laughs> read the rest of the letter. They're a mess. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a mess. And you can go ahead and do it. You're a mess. We're all a mess. Did you catch something here? These folks were definitely a mess, but Paul said, you, I know you. I was there when you got saved. I saw the gifts in your heart, in your life. I saw the work of God from your heart outward. You are still saints. Just remember who you are. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Satan will never cease his work from daylight to dark to try to convince you that you're something other than you are. You, if you've been born again, you're a saint of God, and you have within you the grace, the desire, and the power to be able to do what's right as often as you need to do right and stand for God even in a wicked and ungodly world. Don't let him tell you anything else. And you don't need a whole bunch of rules you just need a heart full of love for your Savior. Be reminded who you are and act like it. So we need to work on our love relationship with the Lord every day and let the fire of passion for Christ burn away the sins of the flesh. You need to remember that your saints set apart for his glory and his purpose in this world. Number two, not only are you saints, but you are united in Christ. 
Now, folks, I'm all for exposing apostasy. I'm all for exposing hypocrisy. But we have entered into this thing just like the, the, the Corinthians had. We've gotten to where if you don't believe exactly the way I believe on unnecessary things, you cannot be one of me. You know, I go, go to lunch often, uh, probably about every other month with a couple of preachers here locally. One's a charismatic preacher. One is a preacher, his church is in the Union Baptist Assembly. They don't agree with me on every single thing, but we're united in Christ. I stand with them as my brothers. They've told me exactly what they believe about salvation. They've told me what they believe about holy living. They've told me what they believe about the, the very fundamentals of the faith, principles of the faith, and we're all in line with all of that. Now, they worship differently. If you go to Pastor Ricky Turner's church, uh, you may not be out until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Anybody from my, my good brother, Pastor Ricky's Turner's church? If you go to Pastor Lorkey's church, you may need, well, no, you won't need to have your ears cleaned out after you leave there. You think the volume's something here? I've been there. They pump it up. And they're a little more active than we are. But he's a precious brother in Jesus Christ. Love him very much. We, listen, you, you say, why is this important? Well, it was important to Paul. Look what Paul says here. Ver, chapter 1, 10, 13. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Pastor Ricky Turner, Pastor uh, Lorkey, myself, uh, Pastor Adrian that I'm going to be having lunch with here in a few weeks that pastors an independent Baptist church down the road here. We all believe the same thing about Christ's salvation and holy living. All of us. He said, speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you perfect, be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. In other words, they had gotten to the point to where some folks are today. Well... I follow John MacArthur. Therefore, I'm so much more intellectual than you are. Well, I follow uh, uh, Rick Warren, so therefore I, I have more compassion than you do. Oh. I follow her. Follow so, <laughs> was that a slip? I don't know. I follow uh, Al Alexander Biggs, you know. So I'm, I'm whatever. You know what happens when we begin to divide over things like that? Look, I admire Dr. John MacArthur. I, you know, there, and then there are some men I don't agree with what, everything that they teach. But when we begin to fuss and we do it publicly and the world hears it, they say, eh, I knew there wasn't any difference. Are you listening to me? Now, an apostate should be exposed. And if anybody's teaching something other than the gospel, they most definitely should be exposed. And if they differ on the fundamentals of the faith, they should be exposed. But if it's just because they worship a little different or their methods are different, they sing a little different, we should not allow that to divide us. And I'm going to tell you something. You may not realize this, but when you go around criticizing every single preacher over some little thing, you are always going to be sometime in the presence of a struggling believer who perhaps is standing there listening to you, and they've been nourished, they've been fed, they've been encouraged by that certain pastor that you're raking over the coals, and suddenly, listen to me, now they're discouraged. There was a website I used to go on because I, I appreciated some of their apologetics, and I would enjoy that. But good night, about three or four years ago, it got to where this particular fellow didn't agree with anybody but himself. <laughs> and I began to see through some of it. Forgive me, but in some cases it was self-promotion. Because listen, if everybody else is wrong, you can only listen to me. 
Last time I checked, they call that a cult. Did you know Jesus on the night before he went to the cross prayed one powerful prayer? Remember what it was? Do you remember what it was? Do you remember what was on his heart before he died? Oh, Father, I prayed that they would be one. I don't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, whatever. If you agree with me on the fundamentals of faith, the truth about the salvation of Jesus Christ, the truth about what it means to walk with Christ, then you are with me. And I'm with you. Amen. Amen. And we need to be careful. We need to be careful. When we begin to criticize everybody over every little thing, just, just over the way they do services, the way they do their service and so forth, their methods, we got to be careful. Because the lost world is looking on, and forgive me, but they don't get it. And Jesus said nothing would, in, nothing would impress the lost world more than when you love each other. When you have that unity. Now, look what he says in verses 14 through 17. Paul feared that the admiration and dedication to, to teachers was so prevalent that his name would have been admired as much as Christ if he, had been bad, if he had baptized a good number of them. Paul said, it's gotten to the place to where you are identifying your salvation with the person who baptized you instead of Christ. Paul said, let me make something clear here. You are to identify yourself. When you are baptized, you're identifying yourself with Christ. Period. Not Russ Hines. Not, not Bill Gibbs. Not Darren. Not any other preacher. You are identifying yourself with Christ. Period. Now, by the way, these verses also prove that, that baptism doesn't save. If you want two passages that really prove this strongly look at if you will at verse 14 because in verse 14 Paul says I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you well if baptism saved you then Paul's thanking God for not getting people saved that's impossible isn't it now if you will look at uh, verse 17 he said God didn't send me to baptize well if baptize baptism saved you, then what's Paul meaning here? Because the very reason God sent Paul everywhere he sent him was to see people saved. Think about it. These Corinthians had begun to identify themselves with the men who had performed the baptisms rather than with Jesus himself. You see, the power and the authority is in the message, not the messenger. Look, if you will, at verses 20 through 25. He says, where is the wise? The word wise here speaks of those that have worldly wisdom in science and philosophy. That's what he's talking about here. Where is the scribe? The scribe speaks of those who are expounders of the law. And look what he says. Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God... The world, through wisdom, did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now notice this. For Jews require a sign. Do you know what the main sign was that Jews always required? A conquering Messiah. We're looking for a conquering Messiah. Well, what did Jesus come as? A humble servant. So he didn't fit the bill. He didn't fit the bill. They were always looking for a sign, Paul says. And Greeks seek after wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Philosophy. Tenets of so-called science. Opposite of what you and I think. But notice what he says. But those, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is is stronger than men. Let me just put it to where we can all get it. Nothing's greater than the gospel. 
There's no better news than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no, nothing deeper than the gospel of Jesus Christ. As the fellow used to say where I went to Bible college, old Dr. John R. Rice used to come and say, there is no deeper teaching than salvation, than the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there's no greater deed than winning somebody to Jesus Christ. Think about that. Now, we're out of time today. So I'm going to stop here, but we'll just pick up here next week. From now on, when I preach, if we don't get it covered, we'll just pick up later on. I'm not going to try to get it crammed in there where you don't get it. I want you to totally get everything we're saying. And remember to bring your Bibles. So here's what I want to leave you with today. What I want to leave you with today is this. Remember who you are. You're saints called to be saints. You have the same calling upon your life to be holy that Paul had to be an apostle, that I have to be a preacher. You're called. And before I was called to be a preacher, I was called to be a holy saint, separate from the world. And we are to be united in Christ Yes, stand against apostasy. Yes, identify everyone who is teaching anything that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ or the word of God. Yes, stand against anybody who's not standing for the fundamentals of the faith. But if it's just because of the way they do their music, the methods they used to, to get people into their church, give me a break. We're to be unified in Christ. Let's bow for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, if there's anyone here this morning, my dear Father, that is struggling to live a godly life in this ungodly world, I pray that you would encourage them with the fact that if they've truly accepted Christ as their personal Savior, if they've truly asked for forgiveness, they've truly repented. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. If they've repented and they've put their trust in Jesus Christ, they've asked you to forgive them. They believe that Jesus existed. He died for their sins. He rose again on the third day, and that makes them forgiven if they'll ask for it and receive it. If they have done that, Father, I pray that you'll remind them who they are. I pray that you'll remind them that they are your bride. And you expect more than a couple of visits twice a year. You expect more than just telling folks they know you and they love you. You expect a relationship. You expect an ongoing conversation. Them hearing you through the Word of God, you hearing them through prayer. They expect a commitment more solid than marriage, more solid than human marriage that says, I have accepted you. I take you as my, my groom, and I turn my back on all other lovers. If they're here this morning, my dear Father, and they failed horribly, so did the Corinthians. If they think that they cannot return, so did the Corinthians. Many of them did. I pray in the name of Jesus, dear God, that they'll get up out of their seat in just a moment, come and take the counselor's hand and say, I'm going to bow my knee and ask the Lord to forgive me. I want to take the grace that's always been there and I want to turn my life back toward God so that grace can continue to draw me closer to Him and further from the world. I've believed the lies of the devil. I've believed the lies of my friends. I've believed the lies of, of others. And I pray right now Jesus will restore my life. Father, that's what I pray that many will do when the invitation is given. 
And then I pray if there are those of us who have recklessly and needlessly criticized somebody just because they weren't exactly like us. If that person believed the truth, if that person stood for the truth, if that person believed the truth of the gospel and the fundamentals of the faith and the sincerity of the Word of God, the simplicity of the Word of God, I pray that they'll ask forgiveness and join the body of Christ to be a solid witness to the world that we may wear different labels, we may worship a little differently, but we're all one family in Christ. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, in these last days when we see this world, just as our congregation said a moment ago, Father, we, we see many, many cities, some, some even see our own city, is just like Corinth. We've drifted so far away. Forgive us, Father. fresh and anew, with fresh oil, with the fresh anointing of the Spirit of God, and revive that grace that's already there, the desire and the want to, and the power to serve you. Help us to fall in love with you fresh and anew. In Jesus' name we pray.